The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond and platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Thank you for coming to day one. We're, we're doing it all over again tomorrow with, with Drupal Camp. Uh, just wanted to mention a couple of things. There's been an errata to tomorrow's speak uh, talks as well. They'll be posted on these tripods in the center and on this end. Uh, there's a t-shirt that we would like everybody here to sign. One of our organizers uh, has become an uncle or an aunt. Um, no, I think it's an aunt today. Jace became an aunt. And he's, he knows he's going to be out of money by the time she's 16, so this is her gift. So if everyone would sign a T-shirt, we'd appreciate that. Uh, as, just as last year, I'd like to mention that we did the math, and once again, you people sitting here, the community, y'all were our largest sponsor this year. You gave our largest corporate donation by 160%, so thank you. Y'all make this happen. And at, immediately after Spot's talk, we're going to, the, the Linux Link Tech Show is going to do a, a quick raffle, and then there's a party at 9. So, and I think th this is, there's a, there's a vendor here that would like to give a gift to Spot before he talks, but uh, this is Tom Calloway. He's our evening keynote. Tom is Fedora. Oh, let me start all over. <laughs> Tom is the Fedora engineer and manager, and he's the chairperson of the Fedora Packaging Committee. He's a prolific package maintainer, and he has extensive experience moving spark machines, I think. So, uh, this is Tom Calloway. He's getting ready to speak. And is Sudo make coffee in the room? Here he is. Thank you for being a keynote. Thanks for everything you guys do for us. Really, thank really you. Appreciate it. Thank Enjoy. you. All right. I was a little worried that nobody was going to like me because you know they shoved me right before the drinks and right at the end of the day when everybody's tired. But hey, look at that. That's thank you so much. All right. So cloud, 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 cloud. Cloud, 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 and cloud. <laughs> cloud, 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 and cloud, 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 cloud. Ah! <laughs> Whoa, okay, I'm, I'm really sorry about that. Gosh, marketing guys got in there. I, I, I really don't know what happened. Um, so that, that has nothing to do with anything what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, my presentation is on this is why you fail and how to avoid it. Everybody fails. I fail a lot. It's not a bad thing. However, as I described to someone earlier, if you've just watched your three friends go into the lion cage at the zoo and get eaten, it would be very bad for you to follow them. So my, my talk is really to uh, point out some things that I've seen to help you not get eaten by lions. I will describe all sorts of animals that can eat you. And if you choose to get eaten after that, well, it's on you. A little backstory here because it seems appropriate. In 1997, I was a junior at North Carolina School of Science and Math in Durham. And I skipped the last day of my junior year to go to Linux Expo 1997. And I have to say, I really don't regret that day that I missed of school at all because it was a wonderful community run event, just like SELF, just like so many other events that are happening everywhere. And the people I met, the things I learned, the things I saw, and the experiences that I had directly led to all of my career, all of my community experience. 
So I strongly encourage you to keep coming to events like this, keep supporting events like this. They do wonderful work. The ideas that you pick up, the technologies that you learn about, and the people, most importantly, that you meet will make the difference. That's what makes this community wonderful. So about me, very briefly, I maintain 350 packages in Fedora, which qualifies me as clinically insane. But to add insult to injury, I also maintain Chromium for Fedora. Chromium being so awesome that it can't go into Fedora. I also have been packaging third-party software of all kinds in RPM format since 2001. And I also handle Fedora's legal issues. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but I talk to the lawyers enough, so I speak a good amount of legalese, and I can translate it into English on a regular basis. Now, we, we mentioned that this presentation was going to be about fail. But really, success is what we're after. We, nobody starts a project, starts working in a community environment, and says, gee, I'm really hopeful for the times I'm going to fail. Success is the goal. But what does that actually mean? Well, I'm here to tell you that from a community project perspective, success is when you have contributors. Because users are great. Users validate that, hey, we're doing something interesting. But at the end of the day, if you only have a user ecosystem, you're not really succeeding because you are the only person writing code for your users. You want these users to take that next logical step and start sending patches and filling out bug reports and helping other users enable functionality, writing plugins, writing add-ons, making fan pages, doing all sorts of craziness that is some step beyond just, I use what you made for me. And when you start to have a successful community, one of the things that you look at is getting your software into a Linux distribution of some sort, or, or a BSD distribution. It could be any kind of distribution. Again, I work with Linux, but there's nothing you know, that says that you can't see success if you've been you know, adopted into a Unix flavor that's doing the right stuff. Most Linux users get their software from their distribution package set, if it's available there. Now, if it's not available there, they'll surely go out and look for it if it's something that's compelling enough. But at the end of the day, that is their first stop. That is their Android market, so to speak, of where I get my stuff from at a first glance. So a healthy community is going to be helping to improve the project, not just the code, although that's a big part of it. You have users that are helping each other. You're not having to hire people to solve user problems. And you're doing regular releases. Because it's great that you did a single code drop in 1998 and uh, everybody still loves it, but if you're not doing regular releases, your community will just dry up and go away. So in summary, no FOSS project wants to fail, but you've got to do more than just have code that works. So this brings me to the meat of my presentation, which is something I call points of fail. In 2009, I was feeling some pain with Chromium. And my pain was expressed through a wide variety of profanity, punching things, frightening children, generally being disreputable to anyone nearby. And so, you know, my friends and coworkers would come to me and say, Spot, why are you so angry? Why do you hate life? Why do you have my pets? And I would say, it's Chromium! And that didn't really mean anything to them, because they saw Chromium as this cool-looking sort of browser that Google had put out there that half the people had downloaded and installed from Google directly. And I needed a way to quantify my pain in, in a manner that didn't just include four-letter words. So I started a list of the things that they had done, or rather had not done, that was causing my rage. And then as I started building this list, I kept thinking of other things that other people that weren't Chromium had done that had caused rage for me in the past, or pain for me, or made me not want to be involved in that project, or made me look at the community and its code base and run screaming away from it before I started to package it. And again, some things are worse than others, so I gave them a point score, because hey, everybody loves to keep score on things like that. So I know plenty of you are involved with open source projects. I know that some of you may be running or directly contributing or involved with. So please, feel free to keep score as we go along. The first thing is the size of the code base. The bigger your code is, the harder it fails. And, and, and let's just be fair about this, because you can look at things like, uh, like a, a LibreOffice or the Linux kernel 
and say, well, those are really big code bases, but those are exceptions. Those aren't the rule. I mean, more often than not, if you come across a code base where the source code is more than 100 megabytes, most people are going to stop and take a really good hard look at whether that's something they want to be poking around inside. Do I want to be contributing to a code base that's that massive? Do I want to start looking at it? And you might think, 100 megs isn't that massive. Heck, we all have terabyte drives now. Why are we worried about 100 megs? But 100 megs worth of source code is a lot of source code. That's a lot of stuff to be looking at. And again, if your code is more than 100 megs when it's actually compressed, <laughs> you get some bonus points for that one. So source control. Now, as a brief lesson on source control, this is where the source lives. There is no good reason for a free or open source project to not have public source control. Nevertheless, if the project doesn't have it, you go ahead and give yourself 10 points. You think, in this day and age of GitHub and SourceForge and all sorts of nonsense like that, that there's nobody that doesn't have source control publicly available. And yet, so many projects are picking up 10 points right here. Now, we continue on this. Because, okay, you've, you've got public source control, but you don't have a web viewer. <laughs> then you get five points. Now, if it exists, but, you, but it doesn't actually work, then you get the five points, too. Now, if you're running Subversion, I'm betting you need to go ahead and give yourself five points. <laughs> that thing, that abomination that you installed that lists directories and does nothing else, that is not a web viewer. That is an index.html. Now, if there's no documentation on how to use your source control, you get an additional five points. It takes no time whatsoever to put documentation that says, here's how you check out, here's how you commit. In fact, if you're using a source control system that the rest of the planet is using, you can cut and paste and steal it from somebody else. And if you look at most websites, that's exactly what they've done. Now, remember, when you do cut and paste and steal from other websites, make sure you put the name of your project in there as opposed to theirs. <laughs> because, because it's awesome to see that you, you know, your, uh, your source control repository, the clone command, actually, you know, checks out OpenOffice, and nobody wants to get that surprise when they actually, you know. <laughs> now, the source control can go wild. If you have written your own source control system for this project, and the project is not a source control system, <laughs> you get 30 points. But even more, if you don't actually use the existing public source control, you get 50 points. And, and you think, nobody does that, but, but they do. They've got this source control that's up there, and there's no commits for the last four years. And you think, oh, this project's dead. Well, no, says the maintainer. You just need to download my code from the web forum. What? Building from source is the next thing. Now, code that doesn't build is usually worse than no code at all. So if you don't have any documentation to tell me who's looking at your code for the very first time how to build your project from source, you get 20 points and an additional 10 points if it doesn't work. If the documentation that you wrote five years ago hasn't been updated and doesn't take into account that now you use make instead of whatever build system scripting you had jury rigged before. You, you, you're turning me away at the gate when you do these sorts of mistakes. And I know it's tempting to say, I'm a coder, I don't write documentation, you know. Well, how in the world am I ever supposed to get involved in your project in any meaningful way if I can't build it from source? And you might say, well, most users won't build it from source, but again, we go back to the beginning part of my deck, not the cloud part, but, and, and we say we want contributors, not just users. So keep that in mind, because a user will never make a jump to a contributor if they never are able to build from source. Configuring is also important, because building is great, but most people want to make a change here or there. They want to tune something. They want to disable a library. They want to add a feature. So if your source is configured by a handwritten shell script, 1992 is calling, and they'd like you back. It's a bad thing. Editing flat text config files, ooh, that's even worse. You get 20 points for that one. Manually editing code header files gets you 30 points. There are some Unix companies that would like you to come work for them if this is your idea of configuration. Now, if your source isn't configurable at all, you get 50 points, because that means you've decided that the code was perfect before anybody touched it. Now, build tools. Now, I'm not here to tell you what build tools to use, as long as you're not using something besides GNU Make. 
If your source builds using something that isn't GNUmic, you just go ahead and take 10 points off the top because 75% of your audience is expecting that make is going to work because that's what we've been conditioned to know. And there are ways around that. I don't care if you have 14 other ways to build the code, GNU make should be one of them. But if your source only builds with third-party proprietary build tools, I don't know, you know, Microsoft Vir Visual Studio, <laughs> 50 points. Now, if you wrote your own build tool for this code, you get 100 points. You've just gone the wrong direction. You, you're so deep in this hole, I don't even think I can throw a rope long enough to get you out of here. And yet, this happens on a frequent basis. When you're reading the build instructions, which are hopefully there, and it says, you know, make is terrible. I hate make. And here's a 14-page diatribe about how make is terrible. But I built something worse, so please use that. <laughs> That's when my blood starts to boil and I start to back away slowly. Bundling. Now, if your source includes copies of other code projects it depends on, you get 20 points. And you might think, but what if somebody doesn't have Zlib? I hate to break it to you, but we all have Zlib at this point. There's no need for you to include a copy of Zlib with there. We're good. And if you really think we don't have a copy of Zlib, your documentation should say, you need Zlib to run this. Go get Zlib from here, because we all have Zlib. And if it's something so terribly obscure that you think no one will possibly have it on their system, or possibly be able to download it, or possibly be able to build it without me hand-holding them through the entire process, don't use it. I'm sure that this great library that you found that somebody ported from BSD to Linux in 1999 and hasn't been touched since then seems like the perfect fit for what you're doing, but you're just, you're setting yourself up to become ugly before you even become pretty. Don't bundle other pieces of code. And of course the argument is, is what about Windows? Well, Windows doesn't have all of these things. Have a documentation that says how to build for Windows. Ship a separate tarball that says for Windows I include all the helping hands and it became over 100 megs as a result. If you want to cater to that audience, do it in a separate way that doesn't affect the rest of us that are normal. <laughs> if your code cannot be built without first building the bundled code bits, you get 10 points. Again, we all have Zlib, we don't need you to build our copy just to discover that our copy is just as good. And if you've modified the bundled code bits, you really don't understand what open source is supposed to be about. Open source is about finding bugs and things that you use, sending the fixes to the upstream, having the upstream sanity check that you're not writing complete crack code, accepting those changes into the library, and then being able to use that system copy across the board. Because you think, it's not a big deal, I'll just bundle a copy of Zlib. I'll make the changes in here that I think are reasonable. Or if we're Debian fans, hey, I fixed this bug in OpenSSL. No one will notice if I just carry it around forever. <laughs> Again, on a one project thing, it doesn't seem like such a bad idea. But when you get on the distribution scale and I'm pulling 14 copies of Zlib out of your thing because every library you pulled into bundle thought it was OK for them to also pull in Zlib. I've pulled four copies of Zlib out of Chromium. Now, libraries. Libraries are good. They're nice. You should read in them. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the libraries that your code builds so that you think, hey, I've written this set of functionality. Other programs might like to use it. I'm going to make it available as a library. If your code only builds static libraries, you get a plus 20 points. Now, there's this argument that I've heard from various academics and idiots that is that <laughs> static libraries make things go faster. That hasn't been true since 2000 on Linux, even less on other Unixes that were smart enough to realize this. There is no real benefit to building static unless you're building pre-built binaries for somebody to carry around. And if you want to do that, that's fine. Do it on your own time. Don't force me to do it. Now, if your code can build shared libraries but only unversioned ones, you're just not thinking about a big picture environment here. And it's not terribly hard. There are tools like LibTool, and I know, LibTool eats babies. Just don't stand too close to it while you're doing it. You can make your code build version shared libraries, and everybody is happy. You're happy. Your users are happy. There's no random conflicts when Oracle comes along and barfs files all over your system in the name of putting a database there. And suddenly you discover that the system library that you thought was there and was intact, because you didn't put a version on it, got 
obliterated by a 10-year-old copy that has bugs in it because they patched in the bundled version. Now, the last part about libraries is if your code doesn't actually try to use the existing system libraries. We go to great lengths in Fedora, and I'm sure the other distributions do too, but I can't speak for them, to make sure that the libraries that we ship are moderately unbroken. They don't suck terribly. They usually work. They're kind of pretty. Take advantage of the work that we put into making those libraries go. Don't assume that we're going to get it wrong because we shipped a bogus compiler in Red Hat Linux 6.2. Try to use the existing system libraries. At a very minimum, it is very simple to check. Try to compile the small piece of code against the library. Test a function that you're worried might not work. If it fails, bail out and say, hey, your library that I was on the system is utter and total crap. Hey, no skin off my back. If it doesn't work for you, let me know. But don't assume before we get that far that it's not going to work, because it probably will. System install. If your code forces an install into slash opt or user local, it probably comes with a license key. That's not the way to do it. I mean, let the, let the defaults be sane. I mean, we have a set of file system hierarchy that everybody knows, that everybody expects. Don't be crazy. Don't be wacky. Just, just use the default paths and roll with it. Now, if your code doesn't have a make install, I really wonder how they expect anyone to actually install their code. Because if, if you generate one binary, OK, I got a lucky guess as to what I should be putting in the user bin. But when there's 175 files that get dumped into the top level source directory as a result of the build, OK, do I copy all of these? Where do I put them? Where should they go? But of course, you're looking at the last item on this slide, which is your code does not work outside of the source directory. So very quickly, those 20 points have turned into 50 points. Because you don't ever intend anyone to install this on a system. It's OK for it to live and run and be happy inside of its little directory. But five years later, when you've gone crazy and they've replaced you, somebody comes along and discovers this system that's very crucial to the company's business. And where does that thing live? Where does it run from? It must be in user bin. All things are in user bin. No, it's, it's not in user bin. It's somewhere else. And everything is somewhere else. And the proliferation of somewhere else's makes the system look like a minefield. And so go ahead, teach your code how to install somewhere, identify what files are relevant in an installed environment, and if you must also support it running out of that directory, go nuts. But just don't make that be the only option. Now, we start to get into the weird stuff. And if your code uses Windows line breaks, not only am I frightened because I realize you're writing for Linux on a Windows machine, just that's, that, is, that, that tells me that I, that I don't want to look any farther when I open it up in the text editor and Emacs or Vim says, I had to convert this so you could read it. Well, all right, you know, I, I, that's, that's when a little part of me starts screaming inside as loud as it possibly can. Now, if your code actually depends on specific compiler features, I do appreciate that you took the time to tell me this. Um, that happens one out of every 100 times when this is actually in play. The other 99% of the time, I discover that when, you know, I'm on a more modern compiler than the one that you used. EGCS has not existed for a very long time. Depending on specific compiler bugs is even more fun. There's nothing that's greater than opening a piece of code that says, please don't build this with a modern GCC. We're dependent on a bug. Now, if you depend on Microsoft Visual Anything for your code to actually build and compile, well, you don't understand Linux, and perhaps you, you've missed the point. Now, communication, going beyond just code oddities and things that make me cry myself to sleep. If your project does not announce releases on a mailing list, they did not happen. No one will know that you released them. You can announce in 16 other ways, but at a bare minimum, you need to go to the effort of having a mailing list where you announce things. It can be an announced mailing list. It can be your regular mailing list. It can be a mailing list that you think no one reads. I don't care. Announce it on a mailing list. Those of us who are trying to maintain things in distributions like to know when you've updated your code. We have lots of things we're doing. We're not sitting around going, did he update? Did he update? Oh, did they update? Announce it. Put it out there. 
We'll subscribe to mailing lists like you won't believe just to keep track of what's being current, to look at what's changing, to make sure that we stay informed. But of course, which brings us to our second item, which is projects that don't have a mailing list. Look, I'm as web 2.0 or whatever is the next guy, but you do need to have a mailing list. A web forum, while great and awesome and fun, is not a replacement for a mailing list. And there will be people who will steadfastly refuse to use the mailing list. That's fine. You still need to have one. Now, if you don't have a bug tracker, I'm starting to wonder if you want contributors. Because the lowest and simplest form of contributor is someone, as a user, who says, something is broken and I wanted to tell you about it. Because that is the minimum amount that anyone can contribute to a project, is to tell them, hey, this thing's on fire. And if I can't figure out how to tell you that your code's on fire, there is no way I will ever contribute to it beyond that point. Now, if you don't have a website, what? And yet, there are plenty of projects where someone has said, hey, could you package this up for Fedora? I go, sure, to go learn more about it. And they go, oh, there's no website. It's in an FTP directory. All right, we're just racking up the points. You're just scoring lots of points here. Now, if your project is SourceForge Vaporware, <laughs> you've got lots of points already, but you get 100 bonus points for that. Because I, I think it's a great idea that you've uh, built a video editing tool that has no code. But uh, good luck with that. Versioning on releases. And again, we're assuming you've done releases, because otherwise, you know, you're just getting all these points. But if your project does not do sanely versioned releases, major and minor, you get 10 points. And you think, what? Everybody's doing sanely versioned releases. No. There's a gentleman who I maintain some packages, uh, some code and packages for Fedora, who releases everything in .zip files that are named project.zip. And every time he does an update, he makes a new project.zip, and he overwrites the one that was in the same place before. And I've tried to explain to him, look, this is really confusing for me, because I have to check some every time I go to see if you've gotten a new one. And, and that seems like a bad approach. Could you just shove a version in there somewhere? I mean, I don't, I, I'm not even going to ask you to put a nice version in there, just some version. It can be a new name every time. You can, you can call it Frank. You can call it Susie, but, but something. And he goes, I don't see what your problem is. You should just be watching to see when I upload. <laughs> this guy doesn't have a lot of community. Uh, and, and so if you don't version your releases, much less sanely, then you've, you're, you're at the 20 point spectrum there. If you don't do releases, 50 points. And, and this is sometimes a controversial point, because we have a lot of people that say, you know, the GitHub model is a good way to work. I'm always just going to commit things into Git. I'm just going to keep moving fast, 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 fast. You can ride along with me if you want, but I'm not going to slow down for you long enough to make a release. That's stupid. I mean, <laughs> be realistic. People want to know, hey, I'm running this version. And at some point, you need to say, what version are you running? It's on fire, but what version are you running? And you don't want people to say, the one I built from Git yesterday. Well, which revision from Git did you build yesterday? I don't know, the one I built from Git yesterday. If you put versions on things, and there are version versions, then people have something to fall back on. You can say, at this point in time it worked, at this point in time it does not. OK, well, what about tagging? What if I just tag aggressively in Git? That's better than nothing, sure. But go the extra step. Take the 10 more seconds to have it be a release, to have it be a release file. And if you're on a nice place like GitHub and you make a tag, GitHub will be nice enough to offer that tag up as a download so you don't even have to do it if you're on a good place like that. But if you're not, again, take the 10 seconds. Put the release out there. Your users will start to thank you and not be frightened of you. Now, if you only release as attachments and web forum posts, you might be 12. I'm not sure. <laughs> And, and, and there's nothing, nothing against a 12-year-old that writes awesome code, but that's not a way to distribute in a meaningful way to build community, because you're on page 34, and is that the most recent one, or is it on page 12 in this forum thread of doom where all these people are talking about how awesome the code is? Releases in format, 
if your releases are only in zip format, you get five points. That's not fatal. I mean, that just means you haven't been outside lately. You haven't looked on the internet. If your releases are only plus 10 points, you haven't left the Apple Store in a while because you're still using OS X compatible zip files. And I mean, you really haven't left the Apple Store in a while because they fixed that a while ago. I mean, if you're only in RAR format, well, I mean, you might be Russian, and there's a lot of Russians that do that. I, I, I can't explain that, but if you're only in ARJ format, man, that is an awesome Doomwad you've got there, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't know that that's code. Now, if it's only in an encapsulation format that you invented, you get 100 points. And at this point, normally somebody goes, that's BS. Nobody does that. <laughs> there was a piece of software, and somebody said, hey, I'm having trouble figuring out how to package this. And I said, OK. And I said, I can't figure out how to get it open. <laughs> so I go to his website, and, I, and I, I find the contact for the author. And I send him an email, and I say, hey, I'd like to look at your code, but I can't figure out how to open it. And he's like, that's because I've improved the compression. <laughs> and I said, really? I said, OK, well, I'm, I'm still following. And, uh, and how do I open this? And he goes, well, you download this binary on my website, and it will open it up for you. And I said, no offense to you, but I don't trust your random binary. And I don't want to run it to open something else that I'm not sure what's inside of it. This seems like a whole lot of fail on my part. <laughs> and he says, dude, don't worry. I have source over here. You could open this up and build it. Need I explain how that failed? <laughs> no, 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 just download the binary to unpack the source to build the binary to unpack the source to build the binary. <laughs> There's so many snakes eating their own tail there. It's just like four snakes. <sighs> Needless to say, that did not get packaged for Fedora. <laughs> Unpacking things. Now, if your releases do not unpack into a version top level directory, and I provided an example glibc-2.4.2. That's a version top-level directory. If your package does not do that, you get 10 points of fail. Because I can figure it out if you unpack into slash say glibc. If you fail at that, then you get 25 points of fail. Because now I'm having to figure out where in the world did this thing unpack. Now, I, even, I don't even give you points of fail if the naming on the tarball is different from the naming of the directory. I'm a smart enough guy that I'll probably be able to figure this out after saying a couple choice words about your heritage. <laughs> but if you unpack it to an absurd number of useless directories that leads me to believe that you don't know how to use your computer, <laughs> like, say, home John Doe, glibc, svn, tarball, glibc, source. Bonus points for using the same directory twice in the structure, by the way. <laughs> 50 points. Because I'm never going to find that thing. Never, ever in a million years is that going to come out of my directory. If I showed you my home directory, you'd be horrified. But it, I'm still not going to find this thing. Now forking. Now here's where I say some more controversial things. If your code is a fork of another project, you get 10 points of fail. And you say, but, 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 but I needed to fork. There was all these extenuating circumstances. No. Forking is good as a concept. It is good that we can fork if we need to. You don't need to. One out of every thousand projects has a valid fork for it. A fork where there was a good reason, it was solidified by other good reasons, and they all lined up and said, we're with you, let's do it. But if your primary developers were not involved with the parent project in any meaningful way, that's not a good fork. I've never seen a successful fork where a whole bunch of random people said, you guys are dumb. We can do it better. I've never seen a successful fork like that. Never, not once. I come across it, and half of their code has been removed and replaced with .NET. And you're like, whoa, OK. <laughs> that started out as Python. <laughs> Sometimes forking is necessary. But it isn't really, not usually, not almost ever. And again, the counterexamples here that people go, well, what about LibreOffice? Yes. LibreOffice made sense. There was a giant crowd of people screaming, this is a bad idea. We need to get off this boat. It's burning and sinking at the same time. <laughs> you know? And, and again, and, and I, I'm, not, I'm not going to say too many names here, Oracle, but I mean, <laughs> you're walking around with a gas can and a flamethrower. No wonder everybody wants off the boat. 
history. Now, until open sourcing it, and, and hopefully you, you started out open source, and this isn't a concern for you because you were smart, but if your code was proprietary at any point in its history, you'd start to rack up some fail points. You know, one to two years is 10, three to five years is 20, six to 10 is 30, 10 plus is 50 points. And you might think this doesn't happen, but it does. And it, it's very prevalent in educational code, where 10 years ago they wrote this code and they had the grand idea of this professor of not having to work at this terrible university with all these terrible children that hate him. And he's going to strike it rich when everybody realizes that this Fortran 77 code he wrote is going to be a jackpot of money. And then 10 years later, crying at home, he open sources it and uploads it to the internet. Nothing good comes from that. I don't care if that code could cause, you know, hunger to go away and world peace to spring out of it. No one's going to be able to build it. No one's going to be able to package it. There will never be a community around it. Anyone who opens it will feel like they opened the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> you cannot change the past, but you may be doomed to fail because of this. And I want to make this point because too often, Proprietary software companies think they're doing a good thing for the open source community by dropping floaters on us. <laughs> hey, you wanted us to open source that? Here you go. There comes a point in time in which you think, this is not good code. No one that works on this code works on it for any other reason other than that we pay them or they're locked in the room. We should bury it in the backyard. Put up a nice memorial to it, have people come and wail over it, and let it go. At a certain point in code's life, the points of fail that it gathers by being open sourced outweigh anything anyone will ever get from it. I speak from experience, Red Hat has bought some terrible, terrible, terrible code. And every now and then, someone comes along and says, hey, what happened to the Netscape email server? We shot it. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> now licensing. Again, I did mention I'm the legal guy, not a lawyer. I won't go too hard on you folks. But if your code doesn't have per file licensing, you get 10 points of fail. And you should think very hard about it. I don't care how unimportant you think that single piece of code is, put a per file license on it. That can be as simple as a comment that says, this code is BSD, or this code is under the same license file as a text file in the main directory. I prefer you be specific, but if you give me some idea of what this piece of code is, it's good. The problem is, is that in 1989, Sun released code onto Usenet, and they didn't put a good license tag on it, and it wasn't quite clear what the license was on it. And that code ended up in everything. People picked it up and carried it around and put it in places. And in 2010, we finally got the last of it eradicated from Linux. It was in the kernel. Your code moves. If you write good code, it will move. If you write bad code, you don't have to worry about it. But <laughs> hopefully. But I mean, code moves. People pick it up. They go, hey, I really like the way you did that foo in that bar. And I don't want to write a foo in a bar. So I'm going to pick up your 1C file, and I'm going to pull it in my distribution. Again, if you're doing libraries, you avoid this. You minimize this. But I know. I'm being realistic here. So just put a per file license on it. So when I come across it 20 years after you wrote it, and you don't want to talk to me about it because you're still having the shakes and rocking back and forth, I have an idea of what the license is on it and whether we can continue to use it. Now, if the licenses in your own code conflict with each other, <laughs> well, you, you, you started to make some pretty big mistakes there. And, and again, this is, this is when the, the, the legal part of me is crying out and, and begging for mercy. But again, you as the copyright holder can do whatever you want. You can put joke licenses on your code. You can make it so that no one who's not named Brad Pitt can use your code. That's fine. You're perfectly entitled to do that. It doesn't affect you in the slightest. The rest of us in the real world are affected by that. Now, when the licenses in your code directly conflict, no distribution that's doing license checking at any level is going to carry it, because it means we have this entirely incompatible ball of stuff. Now, it's pretty hard to actually pull this off, unless you're aggressively bundling, which we talked about before, and you shouldn't be doing that. So you know, just realize that there are licenses that are out there that are incompatible with the GPL. There are quite a few of them that are incompatible with the GPL. 
And, you know, for various reasons, that's a good and a bad thing, and I'm not going to lecture about that. I, you, you can get that from the Free Software Foundation if you want. But just take the moment to look over what you've got and document it. Take 10 minutes, worst case, because you don't have more than 100 megs of code, right? Take 10 minutes, look at all the licenses, write them all down, see if there are any potential conflicts. If you're not sure, ask. There are plenty of people and places that will happily say you have a conflict or you don't have a conflict. You can get lawyers that will tell you this for free because they like having not to clean this up later. Now, if your code doesn't contain any notice of licensing intent, man, that just, how do I know what your license is? I have no idea. And the problem is, is that a lot of hackers and a lot of open source projects that mean well assume that by not wasting time putting a license on it, that people can do whatever they want. But it doesn't work that way. In the United States and in every other country that has signed the Berne Convention, copyright holder gains all rights, user only gains a limited right to use by default. That's it. Nothing else is granted by default. Everything else must be explicitly granted by the copyright holder. You have to tell me what I can do besides limited use. So by not putting a license on your work, it tells me I can do nothing but use. And in some jurisdictions, this may mean I can't even build your code. Take 10 seconds, pick a license, put it on there. A bad license on a code is worse than no license, but utterly unclear licensing means that no distribution will touch it. We will back away. Now, patient distributions like Fedora will ask, please tell us what the license is on that. And if you're still alive, that's great. It's good to get an answer from you. I mean, but in, in cases where you've moved on or you've changed email addresses six times or your email address doesn't have an at symbol in it, <laughs> we have no way to contact you. We can't find you. I mean, one of the things that we're doing right now in Fedora is we are auditing a big repository of code called uh, TechLive. You may have heard of it. We have over 175 components that we cannot determine the license for, and they're kind of important. Half of them, we can't determine who wrote them. They're not documented. There's no attribution of who wrote this code, so we can't figure out who to ask. We're doing the best that we can to try and track these people down, and it's a long and tedious process, but you can save everyone that pain later by being clear and including some notice of licensing intent something that gives us an idea of who wrote it and what the license is. And I realize I'm beating this into the ground. I hope it sticks. Now, if your code doesn't include a copy of the license text, you said, hey, this is code license. Now, if you, if you say this is GPL and you forget to include a copy of the GPL, everybody knows what you mean. Almost no court, and I say almost no court, but almost no court is going to get to a point where you're in front of a judge and the judge goes, well, I don't know. It could be the gopher public license. But it's places when you see things like the full moon license and it's not there, or this code is under the license specified by copying and copying's not there. I have no idea what copying was. Let me, let me randomly look through my system. Oh, there's 175 copies of copying and they're all different. Now, of course, if your code doesn't have a license, 100 points, you know, because you decided that you don't want there to be a license because you hate licenses. You're doing it wrong. I hate to tell you this, but there's almost no situations in which an unlicensed, consciously unlicensed piece of code is a good idea. Public domain is very complicated. It's very screwy. And yes, I know the SQLite guy here is here, but public domain is a bad idea for almost everyone. Unless you are a full-time employee of the government and have no choice, don't public domain your code. Or if you must insist that it's public domain, put a license on it too and say, if public domain works for you, it's public domain. If it's not, it's this license. Give us a choice. Because in lots of places around the world, public do domain declarations don't work. They do in the United States in general, but in most of Europe, they don't. And for Fedora, which is international and trying to be friendly to other people in other countries, we have these problems. And, and I think the problem is, is that people in the US write a piece of code and they put it under public domain because they can and it's reasonably OK. And then someone in Europe sees that and tries to do the same thing, but they can't. They can't legally put something under the public domain. They cannot abandon their copyright. And then we get something from France 
where three guys from France wrote a piece of code together, and they put it in the public domain, and their own government won't recognize it as being in the public domain. No one in the EU will recognize it as being in the public domain, and the US wants to keep treaties intact, and thus won't recognize it in the public domain. And I can't find these three Frenchmen to get them to figure out what the license should be on this code. So just, just put a license on there. We are tracking hundreds of licenses in Fedora. We have a nifty little table that describes them all and where I say occasionally nasty things about them. You can pick any one of these licenses and just use it. And if you really, really, really want to write a new license against my better judgment, we'll look at it and determine whether it's acceptable. But put one on there because code without a license on a conscious decision is very, very, very harming to your community. Speaking of harming your community, copyright assignment. If contributing to your code base requires explicit copyright assignment on the part of the contributor, you are seriously failing. You're getting 100 points of fail right out of the gate. Now, if you're the Free Software Foundation, you can minus 10 points, because they kind of have a, a little text in there that says that we, we only do this to uh, make sure that it will always be free. And you know, that's pretty and hippie-ish, and I, you know, I, I give them a little bit of a leeway on that. But at the end of the day, if your code requires copyright assignment for people to contribute and be involved in it, you are doing it wrong. Nobody needs that. There is a difference between copyright assignment, forcing people to take their rights and give them to you, and asking them for sane licensing permission. Plenty of projects do reasonable licensing permission. Apache, Perl, Python, all of these guys, sane, reasonable, licensing permission requests. In fact, I will go so far as to say there are only two legitimate but poor reasons for a copyright assignment requirement. You intend to make the code proprietary. You want to be able to, at a moment's notice, cash out and make the big bucks off your Fortran 77 pile of stuff. Or you intend to sell the code to someone else or use it as intellectual property to help sell your company. No healthy, open source, free project should have either of those motivations at all, ever. That's not to say you can't make money off your FOSS, but you shouldn't be looking at proprietarizing it, you shouldn't be looking at it as an IP to help you sell your company to someone else. There's no other good reason. The arguments of, I need your copyright to protect you in court, bogus, absolute crap. Every single GPL enforcement case in the United States has been brought up, has not been brought up by a single copyright holder that had copyright across the entire work, and they've succeeded. Lawyers are settling. It's worked in Germany. Everywhere, everybody recognizes that these sorts of things are multiple copyright holder situations. You do not need to be the only copyright holder in play to win a lawsuit. So, I mean, all you will do is you will get people who will want to invest their time, their brains, their hours, the things they know, the things they learn, the things they do, and help you work together to make something great with things is to have a clear statement of licensing intent from your contributors so that you and your contributors that hold copyright are all on the same page about the license of the work so that if you have to go to court, you stand together and not requiring that it be one person. We can talk about that afterwards, but I, but I disagree. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So the the question was is what about things that aren't you know, like, like Perl and Python that have built-in ways to build that aren't make. And, and, and to be fair, those are, those are reasonable things to expect. If the community expectation around a piece of code based on its language is that it isn't make, that it is this other thing, then I would argue that it's points of fail if you've migrated away from that expectation. If someone checks out something from CPAN and, you know, does the regular Perl invocations and magic to make it build as every other Perl component in CPAN does, and it doesn't work that way, then you failed because that's the expectation. But for things that aren't in those specific Perl or Python cases and their C or C++ code that isn't makeified, it doesn't work with make, then that's when that comes into play. Those are clear exceptions that I think uh, don't cause you stress or fail points. Yes? 
Mm -hmm. No, I don't think the question was is, is uh, what about uh, hosting code on Google Code? Uh, do I need to have a separate website for that? And I would say no, as long as you are treating it like a website and not as a code dumping ground, because there are lots of projects that are on Google Code where they say code that does crypto, click here to download. That's not good. That's not a website. But if you fill it out and you flush it out and you use the fact that the Google Code hosting facility has a built-in wiki, has a built-in tree for documentation, has a page to let you describe it in detail, you fill in all the fields so that when I go to it on the front page, I not only have a very good idea of what your code is, how it's built, what it does, how it works, how to start moving along with it, that accomplishes the same goal as a separate website, and you don't need one. All right, well, I don't see anything else, so uh, it's on to the drinking. Thank you very much. I appreciate you giving me the time. that works the way that you do across all your devices HP Slate and WebOS HP As a service leader in cloud computing all we do is hosted computing to us the cloud is just the next generation of hosting and as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together these different sets of technologies and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you.